Okay, we're going to be talking about this evening for the next little bit on guidelines to the will of God. Or simply putting it, knowing God's will and doing it. <laughs> Pursuing His will. Okay. We're going to read, first of all, Ephesians chapter 5. We've, this lesson, for the most part, comes from the book of Ephesians, so um, okay, Ephesians five verse fourteen. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That, that last verse again. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The book of Ephesians is a great a grace book of the Bible. It reveals the eternal purpose of God in grace. If you would look back at your paper, Ephesians 1, verse 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself, that in the dis dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him so this does reveal God's eternal purpose it reveals salvation by grace through faith meaning that it's strictly a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2, if you will, verse 8. On your paper there, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I wish the world could understand and grasp that last verse, because they these guys that go out so when and hear it continually, and I've heard it uh, since I've uh, been teaching Sunday school, actually, when I started. But that old thing, I'm trying to be good enough. You're trying to, you know, satisfy God. But my good works, well, that, that violates the cross, doesn't it? Amen. Okay. But... It reveals that grace saves us for His purpose or for good works. And if you would, look at Ephesians 2, verse 10, right in the middle of your page. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So good works is a part of our salvation, is it not? It's not what saves our soul, but the Lord expects that. He saves us to be His workmen. But after revealing these things concerning God's grace, it instructs a child of grace in the godly walk which grace enjoins. In Ephesians 4, verse 1, if you look back at your paper, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you or beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called. Now the way the scripture says in Romans 11 verse 29, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. I've known people that changed their mind before and took off into the world, but God doesn't change his mind. But in the midst of these instructions, we're admonished 
not to be unwise, but to understand what the will of the Lord is. The Lord wants us to know what His will is. He didn't leave us out in the dark. But how many Christians you know of seriously consider the sacred duty to know and do God's will? Uh, my experience is that most people merely take God's grace for goodness or for granted, never considering that God saved them for service. And many set up their own ideals of service to God, never asking, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Uh, a little while back uh, over here this evening, uh, some reason or other my mind got thinking about some of those snake handling churches. We've watched a video here before, but it's been a good while. And I pulled it up on my phone there a while ago and watched some of those snake handling services. I watched some of those people that, that's gotten bitten time after time. But one guy had been bitten over 130 times, named Dewey Chafin. But they perceived that to be the Lord's will. And the Lord said, in the verses they quote, said the Lord said, if a snake bites you, it won't hurt you. Well, why are them guys dying like flies? So something's wrong, isn't it? The Lord didn't tell us to tempt him, and that's what you're doing when you pick up a rattlesnake and toss it around. God gave us sense enough to know not to fool with that thing. Now, they go over to that scripture there where what happened to Paul when he when he had the ship uh, that sank and they were out warming their hands and that snake jumped out of the fire and latched on to Paul, and they looked and said, man, this guy must be the devil. And they got to watch him a little while, and it didn't hurt him, did it? And then they started saying, he's got to be God, so they wanted to worship him. People are pretty fickle. But understanding the Lord's will and doing what he's called us to do. But you'd wonder what good that these people think that you get out of snake handling. And I read a while ago, one of them made a statement, said, oh, it gives you a high that, uh, unlike uh, whiskey or anything else, that it puts you way up there. I guess so. <laughs> I'd get about high as you can get away from that snake. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> you know, the guy that had that tape, y'all heard about the guy went into the snake handling church and he said, he, he asked him where the back door was and he, <laughs> he was singing for them. He didn't know they pulled them snakes out. And he asked them, said, they don't have a back door. He said, Rick, more than they want one at. Because he, <laughs> he was going to go through that wall. <laughs> but it sounded ludicrous to me where people get that stuff at. Our daughter, uh, y'all know uh, Charlie's taking a job. But his job's transferring him to Conroe and they're uh, our daughter went up there to, or she'd been on the same job out here 25 years she started a new job was it Monday but she went looking for a job here a couple of weeks ago and she brought we had lunch and she showed me the, the job she applied for it gave some uh, must there and she must have got the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues in order to work at that daycare thing. Uh, spoke in tongues. And again, <laughs> that's one of those Pentecostal beliefs, but it's way out there and it's not taught in the scripture. Matter of fact, they were forbidden to speak a word. There's no point in, in, in Brother Enrique talking to us tonight in Spanish because we, we wouldn't grasp half what he was saying. Would we? Now, I'll pick up a word or two every now and then, but I'm certainly not accomplished. But uh, So it can't be from God. God's not the author of confusion. And what, whenever you find tongues being used in the Scripture in Paul's day, uh, it wasn't God that caused confusion. Just opposite. On the day of Pentecost, there were 17 different nationalities 
there. They spoke in 17 different tongues or languages. And it wasn't some kind of gibber-jabber that people don't understand. But nevertheless, there's churches that still teach that stuff. How do we know that? We search the scriptures, don't we? But how many Christians you know never bother to find out what God expects of them? They just go on and supposedly do their thing. But this text reveals that one who does not know the will of God is unwise. It's no disgrace to be uninformed, but it's wicked to stay uninformed. A number of times the expression is used, brethren, I'm not happy to be ignorant. And that's why the Lord reveals his will to us. He doesn't want us ignorant of what he'd have us to do. But it's hypocritical to pray for God's will in our lives and then not seek to know what that will is. It's a lack of wisdom is what it is. But the lack of wisdom and understanding will not be excused in our judgment for rewards. We're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, aren't we? Now, I, I know some preachers that have different ideas about it, but uh, some think the judgment seat of Christ is going to be only to receive rewards. It won't be the uh, fact that <laughs> we don't have any rewards, we're going to be rewarded for what we do, right? But we don't do it for that reason. We do it because we love the Lord, because He first loved us. That's the motive for what we do. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would look back at your paper, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God might, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, again, it said that the man of God may be perfect. That means complete, does it not? Because we're not going to reach a state of perfection as long as we have the flesh, period. But God's given us guidelines of instruction as to His will. The Christian is to observe all things whatsoever He commanded us. If you will, look at Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And folk, if he be with us, who can stand against us? That's what the scripture proclaims. But we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, an unashamed workman, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we will look at the bottom of your page, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And folks, we have to study to do that, don't we? But his instruction is so complete that it leads unto perfection. We just read that a moment ago, that the man of God may be perfect. But he instructs in both worship and service. And just so you know it, worship is not service, but it's praise, uh, song and adoration, meditation, prayer, and thanksgiving. And one may worship anywhere, at home, in church. He's got to do more to serve, though. Linda and I were out yesterday moving around in that beautiful sunshine Everything just lit up. It's springtime, and I, I kept making a comment, comment to her how beautiful everything is. And uh, we know from whence it comes, don't we? We don't take it for granted. 
But one's got to do more than worship he needs to serve. And service must be done in carrying out the great commission which he gave to the church. Therefore, it's foolish to say that one can be a good, and you've heard it before, as good a Christian at home as in church. Y'all ever heard anybody say that? The last verse on your page, Ephesians 3, verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The Lord didn't give the Great Commission to us as individuals. He gave it to the church. But he lets us be a part of his church, which is part of his bride. But God not left our service to our choosing, but he's given us his will. And our willingness to serve must be based upon our appreciation for his blessings of grace. Jesus had said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that should be all of our goal, isn't it, is to keep his commandments. And we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. The commandment he gave foremost was love one another. Love him first and love one another. But doing God's will includes a surrendered life. The study of his word and obedience to that. And then I'll close with a question. Are we willing to measure ourselves by his standards? Well, folk, he laid it out there. And if we fail to do it, not his fault. Scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And everything we do for him should be through him and for his honor and his glory. Okay. The question really is, are we willing to do like the Apostle Paul when the Lord struck him down? You all remember his statement to the Lord? He said, Lord, what will they have me to do? And then we proceed to do what he taught us to do. Okay.